you guys do jigsaw puzzles? All right, so when you're doing a jigsaw puzzle, what are some of the very first things you do? The edges, someone said the corners, okay. Those are some great things. How many of you guys, is the very first thing you do, do you look at the picture? Yeah, you're like, okay, yeah, I see what it is. You know, you're like, I want to do this. You know, last uh, Wednesday, we talked about your context. What are you bringing to the, the studying God's Word? And today we're going to be looking at historical context. We're going to be looking really at, okay, what is this big picture that we're jumping into in studying God's Word? And I want to kind of compare understanding the historical context the same way you're going about solving that jigsaw puzzle. Because as you're looking at the big picture of it all, well, then the next thing you're going to do is, like you just said, you're looking for edge pieces. And not only are you looking for edge pieces, but you're looking for those four corners. Because you know when you have those four corners, you can start building those edges and kind of putting things in perspective. And then all of a sudden, the, as massive as a thousand piece puzzle is, it starts to come together. Because you start to know, okay, big picture, here's where we're going. I'm looking for edge pieces, but I'm looking for four corners to build upon. And I want to give you that same idea because historical context lets us know so much about what God truly intended in that passage. Now, Carlo, if I was going to go to you and say, Carlo, give me the definition of the word deer, what would you say? Uh, deer, like animal? Great. You came back to me with a question. In other words, you're like, I don't know enough information to give you a, a, uh, an intelligent answer. Like, do you mean the animal, like you just said? Am I talking about Bambi? Are you talking about a salutation on a letter? You know, so in other words, you're asking, give me more context. And that's what we're doing. Instead of just looking at Scripture through our context, making assumptions, we already said that was bad last week. What we're trying to say now is, okay, give me more information. So as I observe this text, I have a lot more to work with, and I can make an intelligent decision about what did God really mean in this passage. And so to help us understand that context, that big picture, we got four key questions. Okay? These four key questions are just like those four corners on a jigsaw puzzle. They, they bring everything into perspective. They give you the, a great bearing to start building upon, and it's going to be a lot easier. This is something you're going to know. you got to know these four key questions. So when you look at a, at a passage of Scripture, I want you to start thinking, okay, these questions are jumping to your mind right away. And the first question is this, who? Now, we're going to be talking about quite a few different who's in a little bit, but the first question is, who is the author? You want to be asking yourself your question as you're just observing the text, right? We're not going yet to commentaries. We're not going yet to, to web pages. But you want to ask yourself, yourself the question, does this text reveal to me who wrote it? And if it does in some way, what's their mindset? What's going on in their own life that really kind of helps them think about and communicate? Right? So if you're reading maybe the Psalms, and that says in the beginning of the Psalms, thank you, that you know, this is of David. All right? So we can know a little bit about David. In fact, last Sunday, I, I preached on Psalm 57 to our church. And Psalm 57 not only tells us of David, but actually gives me some information about what David was going through when he wrote Psalm 57. It's a great idea so you can understand their mindset. But another key question to think about with the author is, what is their relationship to with whom they're writing to? my own personal devotion, I just finished re reading the book of Colossians. In Colossians chapter 4, Paul is specifically talking about people that he's had a relationship with and, and encouraging them and, and challenging them with specific special messages. And so you can think, what's his, or her, uh, what's his relationship as the author to whom he's writing to? And lastly, what are those circumstances around maybe why he wrote, what prompted him to write this? All right, remember, this is God, as we talked about a couple weeks ago, God, you know, kind of inspiring man to communicate those exact thoughts that God wanted. What were those circumstances that prompted this message to be communicated? So that's the first two. But who also is the recipient? I mentioned it earlier. There's an author. There's someone who receives that letter. So you want to think about what were the needs and circumstances that made this necessary? Next week, we're going to be looking at the genre of epistles. And we're going to say a lot of these are situational documents written because there was a specific need going on in that church. And they were struggling with something. And you can read, you know, different um, epistles like 1 Corinthians, where Paul just lays into the church in Corinth because they have so many needs, so many problems that Paul is trying to correct. So you want to look at what does this text 
say about what is going on in their lives and what do they need. Also, there might be some characteristics that are revealed about that person or people, if it happens to be like a people group or a church. And so you want to list out characteristics that are mentioned in the text. Now, the last who are what are the main characters of the story? So much of our scriptures are stories, they're narratives. And I love that fact that, that God communicates to us in a narrative. So we want to ask those same questions you would ask about any great story. Some of you film majors in here, this is going to be speaking right your language because as you're looking at what's the plot, what's the story, and how are these characters developed? In other words, not just their names, but what are their needs? What are their circumstances? What are their characteristics? And because as you start really looking at scripture for kind of the richness of all that God gave us, all of a sudden, this has become so much more real to you as you say, okay, these are real people who lived and I can understand what was going on with them. So the first question is who, okay? First question is who. The second and third questions kind of go together and it's when and where. And the real idea that we're trying to get at this are what are the cultural issues? Now, remember last week we talked about, or last session we talked about, you have a culture that you were raised in, and it has shaped you. And so when you see a situation and you're not fully told what to do or how it's supposed to be, your own culture fills in the gaps. So what you're wanting to look for are what are the differences between your culture and their culture? Because those are things that are going to become more important to you. So you can start to understand, wow, this is not like my life today. So you might read a, a, a genre, well, as I was reading today in, in Colossians chapter 4, for my own devotions, and I was, Paul was talking about masters treat slaves fairly. Okay, well, you know what, I, I don't live around slavery. And in our day and age, we've kind of said this is not appropriate anymore. Back then, Paul was trying to redeem a practice that was economically viable for that, that culture, it, but it was, there was abuse going on. And so Paul's saying, look, let's do this right, all right? That relationship that we might not practice today, master to slave, okay? But we could treat slaves better in that culture where it's, 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 that's their livelihood and we can make them brothers and sisters in Christ. We can treat them fairly and equitably, all right? So that's something I want to look more into because there's something that I don't fully understand that Paul's assuming that the church in Colossians, Colossae knows. Now, some of the ways I help myself understand cultural issues are by looking at geography. That has to do with the where. In other words, is this a coastal city? You know, maybe it's a port city. It's going to be a lot more rich. It's going to be a lot more diverse. It's going to have a lot more influence of other cultures coming into the port. So where that city lies makes a big difference. What are the circumstances going on at that time? Maybe some of the religious practices, not only the Jews. Remember, Jesus operated as a first century rabbi. So what are some of the J Jewish practices that he was kind of instilling? But also maybe what are some of the pagan religions at that time that they were living by? You know, always interested to look at other things like political issues or, or family issues or economic issues. In other words, help, me under help yourself understand what's going on during that time culturally. All right? When and where? First question, who? Second question, when? Third question, where? The last question is what? And what is not, what is the meaning? That comes later with interpretation. We're not there yet. We're just observing the text. The what is, what's the genre? And what we're really talking about here is the literary context. All right? The literary context. So in other words, how something was written is the genre. And that literally helps us understand the possible purposes or messages in that. So, Back when I was your age, working at camps, the email wasn't allowed for us normal people. So we did a lot of snail mail stuff, all right? I mean, I mean, so when I was a camp counselor, mail time was a big, big deal. You know, we, we, they announced it at lunch. Everybody was kind of like on their edge of the toes. Did I get a letter? And I had a girlfriend at the time who loved to send me lots of mail, and she would always like put hearts on the outside or, or spray perfume on the letter. And so you could tell this was like a special letter. This was not mom and dad writing from home like, how's camp? How's the food? This was like someone who I cared deep about who was communicating sweet nothings to me. And that letter, I read a whole lot different. I mean, I read that letter over and over and over again because that was my only contact. We didn't really have access to phones because of where the camp was. And so for me, that snail mail was everything. Well, today with texting, today with email, I mean, it's, it's, you, know, you can communicate so fast, but so often 
our communications get messed up because something is misinterpreted. In other words, you know, if we're trying to communicate something important over texting, so many times you can misread something because it, it, the genre is, isn't conducive to that. And so really what we're looking at here is there are different genres throughout Scripture. So we're looking for the, this to give us clues. Now, um, I have a handout for you that, and I'll post this also on, on Blackboard, but here's a list of different genres that you need to kind of know, all right? So this will be something that you're going to need to sh reproduce, like on that midpoint celebration of learning that we like to call a, a midterm. So make sure you don't lose this and you memorize this. We'll practice with this in a little bit. But this helps us say, okay, what are some of the clues about this genre? I don't know if I counted really well. So if we have extras, pass them over here to the right, please. Now, there's some problems when we misunderstand genre. In other words, some people, and the book talks about this in uh, chapter, I think it's chapter 8, in the third edition, chapter 7 in the second edition. I know it's kind of hard to think that kind of stuff through. But there are definitely some, some things we need to understand about genre to help us understand something. And one of the, if you have extras, you can just pass them down to the back side. One of the problems that people will look at is that they think all books of the Bible should be read the same. Well, I just kind of alluded to how I wasn't going to read a letter from my girlfriend the same way I was going to read my letter from my parents. Why would we think we can do that with Scripture? In other words, we have to understand God has a purpose for each genre. It was communicated in a specific way, and that helps us understand really how to read that message and to observe what we should observe. And so we need to understand there are some differences there. There's another misconception, I think, that goes along with, with genre, and that's sometimes people today really discount the genres of the Old Testament. We say, well, hey, we live in the era of grace, and we have a new covenant with Christ, and so I don't need to read about the Old Testament law. I don't need to read about the prophets. That's not me. I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm now. I want to read about the church. I want, to read, I want to read the Gospels. And I think what we have to understand is that's God's an inspired word. There's authority in that as well. And there's something that we can gain from it if we understand how to read that genre. And we'll study that more later on in the semester, how to read these different genres. But we have to understand there is relevancy for us today. Now, there's, I think sometimes we make the mistake that, well, okay, Dave, if everything is inspired and everything is important, then I'm going to read, you know, just that passage. And we can jump into a lot of problems when we fail to look at the surrounding context. And that really is what the literary idea is getting at. The genre is that surrounding context. And that's what chapter 7, and you're, if you're reading the second edition of your book, or chapter 8, if you're reading the third edition of your book, they're basically saying that the surrounding context helps us understand really what should be emphasized or understood. So, for example, it, it, the, the book kind of gets into this a little bit, and it says when writing or thinking about this, you, you need to kind of think big picture. And that's kind of what we're in your lab number two you're going to do. You're going to try to take a look at a whole book, okay? And it's a small epistle. And you're going to answer these four key questions, the who, the when, the where. And you're going to, for the what question, you're going to summarize the paragraphs because that surrounding verses helps us understand the big picture. There's some famous verses that I think sometimes we jump into with it just being that one verse. Um, for example, Revelation 3.20 says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. It's a great verse. How many of you guys have heard that verse shared at like an altar call? Right? You got the pastor going strong, they're doing an altar call. It's like, hey, you know, you need to come to Jesus. Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. And if you'll just respond and bring him in. Okay, <clears throat> what's the context of Revelation 3.20? Anybody know off the top of your head what the context is? Connor? To a church, yeah. It's not to non-believers. It's to a church that has been kind of walking away from their first love of God. And so it's more about, hey, reconnecting with God. It's written to people saying, look, you had a first love. Jesus is still there wanting that relationship with you. All right? This, is, this one is my, just bugs me to no end. Okay, you're in a prayer service, right? And someone says, Lord, we know you're here because we're two or three come together in your name. There you're with us. All right. I just want to scream out loud in the middle of that prayer service going, wait a minute. This has nothing to do with God being with us in prayer. Okay? What is the context? Anybody know Matthew 18, verse 20? That's where it comes from. Anybody know the context of Matthew 18? Yeah. 
Exactly. It's church discipline. See, when I'm by myself praying, God is still with me. You know what? I can claim things in Jesus' name, praying according to his will, and I know God is with me and God's going to you know, give me the answer to that prayer. So that whole idea is, is even if your church is small, when the church comes together, they can ex- extend the authority of God to discipline people in the church who are sinning. Okay? So my point is this. We, we can't just take one verse out of context and say, okay, you know what? We're going to just look at that one verse. The surrounding literary context says, here's what this verse is about. And that's why in this lab, number two, you're going to think in paragraph form. Now, here's something I just want to give you a clue on. The different publishers of your Bibles had scholars that determined, well, we're going to group these verses together to be a paragraph. And other scholars said, no, we're going to group these verses to be a paragraph. So my point is this. Your paragraphs may not match your neighbors. It's okay. All you're going to do is in 12 words or less, you're going to summarize the key thought in that paragraph. So that way you're starting to look at the genre as a whole, as sections, not as just individual verses. The one key thing you're going to need to do with all of your assignments is you always want to give me the reference. So you're going to be... Doing a, this lab on First Timothy, I believe, and so you want to go through in First Timothy one. Let's say one through three is the first paragraph, and you're going to give me that paragraph summary. It's a sentence, twelve words or less that you're going to write about. What is this paragraph all about? And you're going to give me the reference, and then you're going to go down to the next paragraph that you find. Let's just say it's four through six. I don't know, and you're going to give me another paragraph summary sentence, twelve words or less. Okay, this is the last part of lab number two. The first part is answering the who, the when, the where, okay, for 1 Timothy. You're just staying in the text. You're not going to a commentary. You're not going to your study notes. If you have a fat study Bible, you're just staying in the text, okay? That's lab number two. So you're going to be answering the who, the when, the where, and you're going to look for the what. What's the literary context, okay? So I want to practice this. We've got a few minutes left before class ends. I want you to go to Luke chapter 1. Okay, you all have your Bibles. I know you do because you don't want to bring donuts to class. Luke chapter 1. And we're just looking, just in our Bibles, at those first four verses. Those first four verses. And I want you to answer our four key questions. Who is the author? Who is the recipients? Who's any other main characters in there? When and where did this take place? What can we tell? And then what is a genre? Now, There might not be an answer for some of these things because the scriptures don't tell us. And that's okay to say we don't know this. It's also okay to use your brain to say, you know what? We, if this is what was stated, then we know this also to be true. Okay, so in other words, you're not checking your brain out the door and just regurgitating the exact words. You're going to kind of say, all right, if we know this to be true, then he probably was like this as well. Okay, so let's practice this with Luke chapter 1, 1 through 4. We'll do this for a few minutes, and then uh, we're going to come back and we'll talk about it. All right? So let's try real briefly to answer this. I know we got about five minutes left of class. So who do we know is the author? Okay, real quick, we want, we're going to assume that the author is Luke. The only reason I say we assume is because it's actually the title is Luke, the Gospel of Luke. As we know from other Gnostic writings, people can put a title on anything. So in other words, it's unlike the epistles where it says like, I, Paul, here we just have Luke in the title. So just, we're going to assume it's Luke, and I think it's very, um, because one, remember one of the, the tests we put for the canon is, do you know who the author is? Well, they had to understand, we know who the author is. So the title being the Gospel of Luke it's the title. So we, want, we just want to be careful on that. But what do we want, to, what do we know about Luke from this passage? Sorry, what? From this passage, yeah. What do we know from, about Luke from this passage? He knows the story. Okay, he knows the story, but how does he know the story? That's, that's one of the, it's an important thing because he, he wasn't one of the original disciples that we know, but he still knows the story. How did he know the story? How did he find out about the story? Excellent. He researched. Yeah. And I think that's crucial because it gives us some, some assurance that, wow, this guy, he went about this. It was a logical account. He's looking into this. 
That's awesome. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. So we know that he is able to do research. He's smart. He's orderly. That's what I mean. Like you don't check your brain at the door because he's able to, he researched this story. We're going to start thinking, what do I know about Luke? I, I can start putting these things together. What's another thing we might want to know about this author and where he got the story? Who did he talk to getting the story? Eyewitnesses. Yeah. So in other words, he researched and talked to eyewitnesses. Now you can say, well, isn't that another main character? Maybe not because we don't know their names, we don't know much about them. We just know that Luke did research with people who saw Jesus do the miracles, who saw the resurrection, who saw these things, who heard these things. In other words, what he has written down for us comes from firsthand events. This is not like, hey, I heard from so and from so and from so on. Okay? It's not the telephone game. All right, what do we know about the recipient? All right, recipient is a guy named Theopolis. Okay, for those of you who are taking Greek, what does that name mean? Thank you. Yes, you have two words here. Um, you have the word Theo, which means God, and then you have um, the, uh, the last half is worth um, Philos, which basically means friend of or lover of. So we kind of know that this is a guy has a Greek name, okay? And uh, that's what I mean. You don't have to check your brain out the door. If you know the name, you can kind of dive into it. What else do we know about Theophilus? Okay. So he's at least heard about the story, right? Because in other words, Luke is writing to him saying, look, the things that you have heard, the things that you've been taught, I want you to have a certainty with now. Okay. So he, he might be, you know, he has heard this story before to some degree. What's one more thing we know about um, Theophilus? Go ahead, yes. Excellent. Yeah, he calls him honorable, right? So that might just be, this is where we have a question mark for something later on with interpretation. He might have a position of authority. Okay, he might be someone that, okay, wow, okay, this is someone who is honorable and might have some kind of a position of authority. That's why, you know, Luke is writing to him and, and saying, look, you're an important figure. I want to recognize that. That's a possibility because of that word honorable. Okay. Excellent. What do we know about the when and the where? Good. It's after the events have taken place. Okay, good. What else do we know? Is there a, there's a one word in here that gives us a little bit of a clue about that culture. Good. Okay, good. Okay. Good. So we're, we're going to add on a time frame. Excellent. Luke uses the word servants of the word. In other words, it refers back to a culture of where slavery was, was predominant. In other words, when Luke is using that word, it has a unique meaning in that culture when they have slaves, all, servants all around them. I don't have servants. I have interns, yes, but I can't treat them like a slave or a servant. Now, those of you who are interning may have a different view of that. Okay? So that's some of the things we can look at. Let's jump real quick to, what's the genre? Gospel. Okay. Why? Why do we know it's, it's a gospel? Okay, we, if we didn't know this was one of the first four books, if we didn't know the title, what gives us evidence here that this is a gospel genre? Look back to your sheet. Definition of a, go, of a, of a gospel is what? Excellent. It's the persuasion in verse 4. So that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In other words, it's that idea. I'm not just, this is not a narrative. Right? This is not just the story of Jesus, take it or leave it. No, I'm telling you this story because I want you to be persuaded to believe something. Now, Courtney asked a good question about the where. Okay, where does this take place? We don't know, and that's perfectly okay to say. 
not known. That's a great answer because later on when we go into the interpretation stages, we can go back and say, what didn't I know about that passage and how can I use resources to find that out? But we're just taking the observation passage or stage for now. We're just observing the text and what we can see in the text for ourselves. And so it's okay to say, I don't know this. All right. This is what you're doing in lab number two with the book of First Timothy. You got it? All right, guys, we're over time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.